welcome back everybody to our next talk which will be held by Jochen Lilich um, and he will talk about dynamic infrastructure orchestration. Hi and welcome to my talk. My name is Jochen Lilich. Um, on Twitter I'm at Jeevis. I'm 44 years old and I uh, live in Ireland, a bit south of Dublin, at the Irish coast. I've been a, a Linux sysadmin since 1993 and uh, worked as an IT trainer, as an IT manager and uh, in 2010 I started another company called Frysteel IT and we are um, specialized in, in building high performance Linux infrastructures, especially our main product, uh, which is called Frysteel Box, which is a platform as a service that's completely optimized and completely managed by us for Drupal and WordPress websites, especially bigger websites that uh, need complex um, web hosting infrastructure. When I started uh, building our um, platform, I started with uh, configuration management from day one. Um, we've grown from a single server um, and uh, to, to a few hundred servers now. And uh, we started with our first operation server called Ops01. And it ran two services, Nagios and Chef. And from there, we grew to a much bigger infrastructure. And thanks to Chef, we've been able to um, manage all these servers with all the different services with two system administrators also doing on-call duty. Um, so configuration management, I think, uh, is, an, uh, is totally necessary and it's good to have it from the start and uh, it's much easier to integrate it if you have it from the start. Um, I, Certainly every one of you is uh, familiar with Puppet or Chef or uh, Ansible or other um, configuration management solutions. So um, I think uh, it's quite easy to say what's the advantage of using configuration management. You have much less manual changes. Uh, in the best case, you don't have any manual changes. And uh, you do everything controlled by a central um, instance. That makes sure that all your servers are configured as you want them to be. Um, everything is consistent, so you don't have any side um, effects of uh, configurations that um, deviate from your standards. And uh, you have a single source of truth. Um, in the case of Chef, you uh, have a central database that contains all the nodes you are running and all the data about these nodes. You can query this database and you can see, okay, um, what server is in what cluster um, and uh, with this information, for example, you can configure a load balancer. Uh, if you add another server, uh, Chef will make sure uh, this server will be added to the cluster. And um, configuration management also makes sure that you don't have to repeat yourself. You simply get a cookbook or a manifest and use that to have the same installation um, on every server. But configuration management also has its weaknesses. Mostly um, configuration management uh, uh, works with periodic convergence runs. So you have, for example, a chef client that runs every half hour or in our case, every 10 minutes. And this introduces change lag. It can take uh, up to 10 minutes or half an hour or an hour um, until changes have um, been reflected on your servers. And uh, if you have for, uh, if you depend on information in the central database, this can be even more, uh, because first a node needs to uh, do a convergence run. The results of this run are then stored in the database, and then maybe after another half an hour, another node queries this database and uh, uses the updated data. So um, change lag 
um, will be there. This is bad if you have um, processes that uh, depend on quick changes. For example, cluster membership. You don't want to add a server to your infrastructure and then after half an hour or an hour or even later, um, uh, it actually joins the cluster. Even worse is in the case of master or leader elections. If you have multiple databases that need to work out who is the master, who is the slave, um, you don't want to um, have a lot of lag in there. Uh, also, for example, if you are using configuration management services to deploy applications, you uh, want to have that quite quickly. For example, in uh, an early generation of our um, hosting platform, we had um, the deployment of the websites um, controlled by a cron job that ran every two minutes, checking if there was a, no a new uh, revision in the Git repository and uh, eventually rolling this out. Um, we had a lot of support requests with um, inpatient customers that didn't want to wait two minutes for each of their changes, even with only two minutes. So things like deployment or, as, an, as another uh, example, service discovery, you don't want to have change lag with that. So when I'm talking about orchestration, I mean that I want to have changes being performed quickly, in the best case, instantly. Um, and I also want to be able to handle failure. For example, if nodes fail, I want this reflected in the load balancer configuration. I want this uh, maybe uh, reflected in deployment uh, services and other things. Um, quickly means without lag. Um, in the best case, immediate reaction to changes. And I'd also want to tolerate network partitions. Another problem with a central database is uh, if this uh, database isn't reachable anymore for a certain number of, no of nodes, this will also um, cause problems. For example, um, if a deployment um, change needs to be rolled out and uh, one of three nodes can't reach the database, um, we'll have different rollouts on the cluster nodes, and we don't want to have that. In order to solve this problem, I um, researched uh, a number of tools, and I've taken two of them to talk about today. And the first one uh, is Surf. Surf is a quite young tool that's uh, been developed by HashiCorp, which is the company of uh, Mitchell Hashi Hashimoto, the author of Vagrant. And it's a cluster communication tool that's very easy to install. It's a simple binary. Uh, it's written in the Go language. And uh, you can download a simple zip file that only con contains the binary for your Linux platform. Um, you unzip that, um, put it in user local bin, and you can uh, use it. Go uses the gossip protocol which is a peer-to-peer -peer, um, protocol um, that doesn't need any central data store, like, for example, mCollective, uh, which needs a central message broker to communicate. With Surf, you have each node com communicating with the other nodes, exchanging data, so um, they pass on messages from node to node, which uh, actually goes quite quickly even if you have a lot of nodes. And um, the gossip protocol makes, it, uh, makes sure that your information within the cluster is eventually consistent. So if you have, for example, a network partition, um, uh, Surf, Surf makes sure that um, events are communicated to nodes that are temporarily offline. After installing Surf, you can start uh, building your Surf cluster, which is quite easy. Um, I'll also demonstrate that with a uh, virtual machine um, soon. Um, you simply start your first Surf agent. Is that readable, uh, readable at the back of the room? Not so good. Okay. Um, 
Well, let's switch to the terminal then. That should be better. So if you've installed Surf, you simply um, use the Surf agent command to start your first Surf node. You need to give this node a name, creative as I am. I simply choose node 1. Then um, I say bind it to the host name and the IP address as rv1. And well, for a start, that's it. Surf starts, binds itself to port 7946. And as you can see, uh, there was a first member jo uh, join event um, for the node itself. And then we can simply start another node, surf agent node 2, bind to surf 2. Now these are still separate clusters if you can call them clusters. It's they, they, uh, these two servers don't know anything about uh, the other. So what we need to do is now join the second server with the first server. And as you can see up there, the server recognizes that node 2 joined the cluster, and now we have a two-node cluster, which we can also see with the serve members command. It's that easy. You can do that uh, 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 literally within three minutes if you are quick with unzip and quick with typing. Um, you can uh, start your first serve cluster within three minutes. OK. Back. Here, so that's node one, node two. There are several things that Surf takes care of. First is membership. As you saw uh, in the log, um, node, uh, node one noticed when node two joined the cluster, and with commands like Surf members, or of course with an API call, you can query which nodes are in the cluster. And uh, uh, so you can um, use this information, for example, to um, configure services like, for example, a load balancer. This only works if you al also have failure detection. Surf detects failure very quickly. We can test that as well. I'll simply use my VirtualBox console to pause, to suspend the second node, which I'm doing now. It's paused. And there's the member failed event. And now, uh, if, if I had more cluster nodes, they, they uh, would be passing this information around. So within seconds, all the, the uh, cluster members know that node 2 has failed. And uh, if I unsuspend this virtual machine, it goes even more quickly. We are right back. What makes Surf quite powerful is that it also can execute handler scripts for every event that occurs within the cluster. Um, these are the seven types of uh, events we can have with Surf. So we have the join event, we have the leave event that happens if you, for example, simply stop the Surf 
daemon um, on a node. We have the member failed event that we saw earlier. Uh, there's the member update event. The member reap event happens if a um, node has failed uh, for a longer time, and the timeout that's configured for um, the cluster has um, expired, then the node is completely taken out of the cluster, and um, uh, yeah, it's gone. And there are two additional events that you can use for your own uh, purposes and applications, which is the user event. You can simply uh, send a user event um, to notify your cluster nodes of something. And there's the query event where you can ask your cluster nodes to give you a certain information. For example, you can use user events to trigger a deployment. You can say, OK, my Git repository has uh, um, received another push. And then you'll simply send a user event, deploy my application. All the cluster nodes receive the event. And uh, if they feel like it, they'll deploy your uh, new revision. You can also perform a convergence run. So um, although there are um, examples on the serve documentation that show how you can use an event handler to directly change a load balancer configuration if, for example, a node fails, um, I don't think that's a good way to approach this because uh, sooner or later, you'll be reprogramming all the functionality we also ha already have in Puppet or Chef. For example, having templates to generate configuration files, to restart services, things like that. Uh, there are proven applications for that, and uh, I don't think I'll replace our Chef server anytime soon. Um, but um, Surf is quite handy to simply trigger a con convergence run, and we'll probably use that to have longer periods between our regular con um, convergence runs. For example, run chef not only uh, every 10 minutes, but every hour or so. And if need arises, we can simply do a user event that will trigger a chef client run as, uh, at any time we need it to run. And as I already mentioned, you can use the query event to query information from the cluster. So you can, for example, ask all your cluster nodes which revision is deployed uh, on your uh, local installation, and you'll get all the um, results back. OK, so Serve was easy to install, easy to start, and it's very easy to use um, event handlers. That's for example, a very, simply, a very simple event handler, a simple shell script that is run every time our surf cluster receives an event. And um, it simply uses the environment variable surf event to see what kind of event that was. And if it's the type user, there's another variable called surf user event that then contains the, the name you used for your user event. So calling a user event could look like this. Simply serve event deploy app. Deploy app is the name you choose for your event. And you'll get a log, a log entry like this. Um, simply received event, user event, deploy app. You can also add a payload. For example, you can say serve event deploy app and then the git commit ID to uh, make sure the right revision is deployed. Uh, unfortunately, there are limits to that um, payload since um, serve uses UDP. Um, you are limited by the UDP packet size, so um, you can't go wild with your payloads, but if you simply can transfer a kind of key that the client then can use to get more information, um, I think you'll be good. So let's see how that works. Yes? Hmm? 
Mm -hmm. What happens if I send an event and one of my nodes is offline at that time? Um, well, uh, as I said, uh, surf uh, or the gossip protocol to be exact is eventually consistent so um, your failed node will get this message after it returns to the cluster um, it may be after a few seconds a few minutes or hours uh, that depends on, on how quickly your node um, comes back but uh, it'll receive the the message yep it it'll receive it only once Another question? Is uh, surf limited to a single subnet? Is limited to a single subnet? No, it isn't. So there's no um, broadcasting or uh, things like that. Um, you can use uh, also, uh, your your cluster can be all over the place. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, user events using an event handler really is easy. I'll stop my surf agent here and simply say use my handler dot sh as an event handler. Uh, surf simply uses standard in and standard out to uh, pass information, for example, about the payload that came with the user event. Um, in order to display what, com what, what data this is, I'll set the log, log level to debug. Huh. Okay. Never do live demos. Or try to save keystrokes. So even this, the simple member join event from the node itself triggers the uh, shell script and the shell script says new event member join uh, and the data, the payload of this event contains the node name and its IP address and if uh, I send an event, for example, surf event deploy the damn thing and a git hash like 07fg and so on. Ah. Yeah, it, I haven't joined it with the cluster again. Should do that. So serve join serve two should do the trick. Okay, I'll have to resend the event because the node wasn't failed, but it was, wasn't simply a member of the cluster at that time. And now I have my user event with the payload 07FG. It's as simple as that, and of course you can uh, make the things more complex using other programming languages or um, yeah, whatever you like. Another question? That's right. Oh, sorry. So the question is, uh, what nodes do execute their event handler if an event occurs? Is there some kind of master? Can I limit um, uh, where event handlers will be fired? Um, Event handlers will only be fired for uh, where uh, you've started serve with the uh, event handler information in the command line. And from then on, it's simply um, uh, your choice how you parse the uh, event. And uh, you can always decide to, to drop the event in your event handler. For example, if you have different applications that you want to deploy, uh, you can decide on the local machine, is that an application that I even can deploy? And then um, you can simply drop the event 
if uh, it doesn't make sense to execute the event. Yes? Is there a master? Is there a master? No, there isn't. Um, uh, there are um, serve nodes that can, that can have um, certain roles. For example, you can start a monitor agent um, that will um, list more information um, about what's happening in your cluster, um, but uh, there isn't a single master server. Um, as you saw in my first example, I had serve2 join serve1, and now um, uh, I did uh, serve, uh, add serve1 to serve2, so um, there's no um, master or slave concept here. Yes? Um, is, is that a no, it isn't. Uh, yes, you do. Uh, I, I don't know if it's, it's, if it's a frightening number, uh, because every node uh, tries to communicate with every other node. Um, the gossip protocol seems to be quite intelligent uh, in terms of uh, bigger clusters, so um, I don't think that you'll have a problem with running 100 or 1,000 nodes with this protocol. It's, it seems to be quite efficient. Um, I haven't run it uh, on, on big clusters, uh, with a few hundred nodes yet, um, but I'm quite optimistic that I won't have any problems. Is there any kind of authentication? No, there isn't. Um, so um, you have to have, uh, have additional uh, measures, for example, um, control who can access your serve port. Okay, that's serve. Um, I don't know. I don't know, actually. I, I'll have, I'd have to, to uh, see the gossip documentation, how uh, it'll work internally. Okay. Another tool you can use to have a distributed architecture um, that, is, um, for, that is, on one hand, quite quick in reaction to changes, and on the other hand, easy to, to use, and on the third hand, um, uh, tolerant to network partitions and things like that, is etcd. etcd is a highly available key value store, comparable to, for example, Zookeeper or Doozer. Um, it's developed by Core OS um, and also written in Go, seems to be all the rage at this time. Uh, it uses the raft consensus algor algorithm um, to have consistent data within an etcd cluster and uses a purely HTTP API to communicate. This makes it also very easy to install. Um, again, you simply um, clone the etcd repository, run the build script, um, you'll also uh, have to have a recent version of Go installed, and then you get a single binary that you can run. Key value store means that you have a hierarchical um, structure of keys to who you can um, assign values. For example, uh, here I have a key release that has a kind of hash assigned and then there's a directory cluster which contains two keys, node one and node two, with their values. So it's easy to um, use etcd to store information, for example, about uh, new releases to deploy or to have uh, cluster members listed here. And um, with etcd, you can run as many etcd nodes as you want. For example, I've taken five um, nodes here, and they use a quorum algorithm to make sure um, you, ha you still keep consistent information, um, even if some nodes fail. So if you have five nodes, um, of course, your cluster is available. 
and your cluster will stay available um, as long as it has more than half of the original nodes. So with one node failed, it's still available. With another node failed, it's still available. And uh, if your servers are contacting etcd to get information, well, if they ask one of these three, they'll get uh, the right information because they are in the majority. If they ask one of the, or if they try to ask um, one of the failed nodes, or if if these nodes are in another network partition, if you have some kind of network problems, um, these two nodes will um, refuse to make changes to the key value store. They'll still be able to read uh, keys, but um, uh, in order to preserve um, consistency, these um, uh, separated nodes will not make any changes anymore. And if your cluster shrinks to two nodes, of course, it'll be unavailable. So what number of nodes would be good? Well, uh, obviously, to have an uh, efficient quorum um, result, you'll probably uh, want to have an odd number of nodes. And you can start with three nodes. And according to uh, CoreOS, uh, they recommend having, um, at the most, nine nodes. Otherwise, communication between the nodes will be, um, will be hit by a performance um, malice. So three, five, seven, or nine nodes would be good numbers. Writing to the key value store is easy. You can use the etcd control uh, command line tool, or you can simply use HTTP requests using curl, or, of course, you can always use an application to do these HTTP requests. And you can say, for example, here, uh, set the key message to the value hello, and uh, etcd will do that. And uh, if you use the curl call here um, to set the same key to the value test, you'll get back a JSON uh, payload that'll tell you, OK, I've set the value to test. And you'll even get um, information about the previous state of the node. Because, uh, so uh, it says, OK, previously the node had the value hello. Reading this, key value store is equally easy. etcd control get, or a simple get request via HTTP will get you your information. And using the delete um, method, uh, you can also remove keys. Um, uh, the do you get the previous value as well? No, you don't. Uh, you may be able to use the modified index to uh, get previous values. I'll get back to the modified uh, index soon. So. That's all good, but um, in terms of uh, automating infrastructure, you'll probably want to um, know when keys change. For example, if another node joins your list of cluster nodes, or if the release key changes after a git push, um, you'll want to know about that. And uh, that's where you can use the watch. Which which uh, will simply wait until a key changes. Or you can use also a recursive option to say, I want to watch the cluster directory and want to be notified if any entry, any key within that directory changes. So for example, you can use this curl, key, uh, uh, curl uh, request to say, OK, watch the release key and wait until it changes. It'll uh, do a long-running HTTP call that uh, 
will be kept until the event happens and as soon as it happens you'll um, get another JSON payload that contains the key and also the previous state of the key. To come back to a previous question, what happens if my web server, for example, um, was offline for, for some time and couldn't watch my release key? Uh, will it, how, how will it um, see if uh, there was a change? There's another option you can use using the wait index option. And there you can say, OK, the last um, state I know of this key, for example, is the index 14. So if you do uh, the same watch with wait index equals 14, you'll get um, your JSON payload back immediately because your uh, weight index is lower than the, car than the current index, so uh, etcd will give you your information immediately and you'll see that you need to catch up. You can use etcd for quite uh, a number of applications. Um, Building upon the watch concept, you can use, for example, locking. Your application can say, OK, I'd like to change this key, and I'd like to own it, so that no one else can change it anymore. Um, if you are the first, um, you'll get the change, and you'll get the lock. And if another node comes and says, OK, I'd like to own this key, um, etcd will say, OK, uh, it's already taken, you need to wait. And not until the first server gives up its lock, the second server will get its lock. Um, you can use this, for example, for leader election. If you have different database masters that need to um, uh, find out who will be the master and who will be the slave, you can use that. You can use it to assign failover IP addresses um, every time uh, you need to decide who is going to be it, uh, you can use this. And I also have a, an example for that, uh, this leader election. So let's say we have um, our etcd cluster, here uh, the green circle, and our application, and our application wants to know what database to talk to. So it'll ask, the etcd server, what's my database? And etcd will say, don't know, there's no database. And the app now says, OK, I'll wait, which means I'll, um, I'll request a lock on the database master key. And as soon as that changes, it'll get back the information. This only will change if we get a database. So let's say we get our database. The database then goes to etcd and says, I'd like to be the master. And of course, it'll get this granted. Now etcd um, can, uh, this of course will also be done with a locking um, approach. So the database X will request a lock on the master key, it'll get it, and uh, etcd will then use the already established connection to your application to say, talk to database X. And database X now will also um, have its lock on the master key, and your app can now work with database X. OK, applications running, time to set up a standby database. So we have database Y, which will also come and say, I'd like to be the master. But no can do. There's already a master, and there can be only one. So database Y will now also try to get a lock on the master key, but uh, it'll have to wait. 
wait until database X fails, which will server the connection to your application, which uh, will also have etcd realize database X has gone. So uh, the lock of database X will, to, will be gone also, which will enable etcd to give the lock to database Y. And it'll also inform the application that the database Y is now the master. Application can talk to the database, and that's it. These are only two examples of current technology that enables you to um, add more dynamic to your configuration management. There are more technologies. For example, I mentioned um, Zookeeper or Doozer as key value stores. There's also um, um, cluster management tools similar to Surf, for example, M Collective or um, uh, yeah, a, a list of other tools. But um, in, in my opinion, uh, Surf and etcd are both very, very simple to set up and to use. So it's easy to get started. Um, for example, simply with the use case of using Surf to trigger additional conversions runs with your existing configuration management solution. And from there, you can go wherever you want. You can add deployment functionality. You can make your event handlers as complex as you want. And uh, it's very easy to grow your infrastructure and without introducing a lot of lag, um, without losing the um, possibility of having changes made very quickly, for example, um, to remove cluster nodes as soon as they fail, um, to add um, nodes in a auto-scaling uh, environment, for example, and um, with tools like etcd, it's also quite um, easy to have a central, no, it's not central, but um, uh, a very highly available key value store that uh, can contain um, a lot of information etcd performs perfectly with uh, hundreds or thousands of changes per second. Uh, so even if you have a very um, dynamic environment, etcd will serve you well. Okay, um, that's my presentation so far. If you have any questions, I'm available here. You can uh, find uh, slides of this talk uh, and other talks uh, at Speaker Deck. You can reach me on Twitter or via email. And uh, I'm looking forward to your questions. Um, what are the advantages over Zookeeper? Because from my, what I've seen in your presentation, it looks pretty similar from the concept. Mm -hmm. And Zookeeper itself, it's complex, yes but it is very mature, it, it just works. <laughs> that would have been my answer as well. <laughs> um, it's, a Zookeeper, for example, is more complex to set up. Um, uh, it, it'll also require additional libraries, for example. If you want to integrate it in your application, you'll always need the uh, Zookeeper library that fits your programming language, and uh, that's uh, one of the main advantages of etcd is since it simply uses http requests um, it's very easy to use and uh, you are not dependent on third party libraries um, which is quite uh, which can be quite complicated uh, from time to time with zookeeper getting the right for example ruby uh, gem to use and have uh, yeah choose a, a well maintained one and things like that um, also um, Zookeeper seems to be uh, seems to need a lot more connections if you are using things like watches or yes. stuff like that. Um, from what I've read, uh, etcd is far more efficient in terms of network con connections um, if, uh, to to propagate um, uh, information within the key value cluster or with the clients that are depending on it. Okay, thank you.
Further questions? Just an additional cool tool to use with Etsy and with etcd is uh, Helix DNS, which uh, points, or you, you point a host name and uh, you give a value as an IP address, and from then on you can uh, query this DNS and it will serve you the the host name with IP address. So it's pretty cool. So, so you can use etcd as a DNS yeah, server, basically. Yeah, you set host name equals IP address, and from then on you can use it as a DNS entry. <laughs> That's interesting. Of course, you can to use to uh, tools like Surf or etcd to have a highly responsive DNS server. So, for example, if you use TinyDNS, uh, you can make changes to, the, to your DNS uh, information if a node fails or things like that quite quickly. But uh, using etcd directly as a DNS server is, is, is very funny, yeah. Do we have any questions left? I'm sorry, it's a, a little late today. I, I did not understand uh, what can I use this etcd for if it, I can only use it on three to nine uh, unequal nodes. What happens with scaling? What, what are the, the use cases for such a tool? I, I really did not understand. Okay. Uh, in, in that case, uh, we have a, uh, well, let's say client-server uh, environment, or it's a client etcd cluster environment. You can have as many clients as you want, but uh, to be highly available, to, uh, to be highly available, your etcd, uh, you can't run a single etcd server, you need a, an etcd cluster. And for that, you'll use three, five, seven, or nine nodes um, uh, five nodes seems to be quite common um, because you will have a lot of high availability. You can lose as much as two nodes uh, without the, the cluster getting unavailable. And um, that's uh, the limitation. Um, of course, you can have uh, hundreds or thousands of clients um, writing to or reading from the etcd cluster. Back there. Oh, one question I have, um, uh, if you have five nodes and one is gone and you decide that it's gone for good, could you remove it from the cluster or will it stick with the cluster as long as it comes back? So you have five nodes, one is missing and then another one is missing and then you want to say, okay, my new cluster size is three. So if you, if you grow to five nodes, could you reduce the size of the nodes or will you, could you just add servers to the ETCD cluster? I'm not sure. Um, you'll certainly be able to uh, uh, solve that problem with a restart, of course, but you probably don't want to do that. Um, I remember reading about uh, recent versions having additional um, options uh, regarding the cluster nodes. You can do HTTP requests to etcd also to, for example, get a list of all the nodes. Um, and there may be a new function that enables you to remove a node from the cluster uh, membership list. But I'm not sure about that. I, I need to research that. Um, I just remembered um, a, a, a another hint. Um, starting an etcd cluster is quite easy. You start your first node, and then you start your second node, and simply add a command line option that says join the cluster of server one, for example. So, so you will simply say which are the other nodes in your cluster. But that requires you to have at least one uh, cluster node, to know at least one cluster node, and you'll get into a bootstrapping problem. Um, and uh, 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 there's the the possibility of running a discovery cluster, and the folks uh, from, from Core OS uh, run such a cluster. You simply um, use a, an individual token, and you say, okay, uh, here's a cluster node that wants to join my etcd cluster, and uh, you'll register, basically, uh, each node with this discovery service, and 
you can get the other nodes from, back from this discovery service without uh, having to know uh, what nodes you have. So there's the uh, discovery.etcd.io, I think, um, which you can use to uh, simply... Uh, so, for example, you can use a simple puppet um, manifest that simply says, OK, you are a etcd node, ask the discovery service for the other nodes, if there are any, and uh, you can do the same on all the other nodes, so uh, your nodes don't need to know of each other initially with this discovery service. Yes? One more question to, to serve. Um, it looks promising, but isn't there some feature request to have in a cluster secret like in CoroSync? Because from the concept, it looks like CoroSync. But for us, CoreSync does not scale. So if it scales but doesn't have a cluster secret, yeah, I would not put this into production. Yeah. Um, I'm not aware if there is uh, some kind of uh, request for authentication, but uh, it's, uh, I'll find out for you. Um, uh, simply uh, ask me again in a few minutes. Any further questions? Okay then, thank you very much, Jochen. Thanks for staying awake. <laughs>